subscribe. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coburn. And starring two of radio's foremost actors, Ralph Bell and Brett Morrison, in The Planet Zidius. This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as I retell a story which so many listeners have asked to hear again. It's the story I call... The planet Zevius. Our story begins in a large, darkened laboratory filled with intricate machinery and instruments. A half dozen engineers are seated before control panels which run the length of the laboratory, while two small, slender men stand in the middle of the room looking up at a large screen. A screen which reveals the celestial heavens to them. The two men follow closely, anxiously, the movement of a pinpoint light across the screen. Signal's coming in much stronger, Commander. Yes. The ship is approaching the stratosphere. I think that this time we've succeeded. Let's hope that all goes well in the landing. Yes, we've waited so long for success. Pay close attention to the controls, men. The IPX-4 will soon enter the stratosphere. Prepare to land it. Pardon me, uh, Commander Destro? Yes, yes, what is it? My name is Bedre. I've been assigned by the Scientific Council to act as historian for the work you're engaged in. I see. Well, you come at a most... Momentous time, Vidre. If you look at the screen above us, you will see history in the making. Oh, uh, allow me to introduce Professor Capasio, our chief scientist. How do you do, sir? I'm happy to meet you. You were saying, Commander, that history was being made this very moment? Yes. You see that small pinpoint of light on the tetra screen? Pinpoint of light? Oh, yes, I see it. That is the IPX-4, Interplanet Experimental Ship Number 4. This year will go down in history as an epoch-making year. You mean that... You actually succeeded in... The IPX-4 has entered the stratosphere. Attention, Master Control. Prepare to land the IPX-4. Switch on retarding jet number one. Switch on retarding jet number one. Switch on retarding jet number two. Switch on retarding jet number two. Instrument reading. Speed, 1,200 miles per hour. Altitude, 60,000 feet. 900, 40,000. 700, 30,000. 500, 20,000. 300, 10,000. Speed, 100 miles per hour. Altitude, 2,000 feet. Signal base crew to stand by. Base crew signal to stand by. Instrument reading. Covering 500 feet, 300, 100, flight completed. The IPX-4 has landed, gentlemen. And with it, a new era has begun. An era in which we shall travel through the entire solar system to other planets. You finally succeeded. Yes. And the crew... They came through without any injuries or ill effects? The entire flight was controlled by us from this laboratory. The only crew we had on that ship were animals. And the animals are alive and well. The flight vision screen aboard the ship permitted us to see and hear them every moment of the flight. Now there remains but the final step. A flight with human beings as the crew? Yes. We shall start to prepare for it immediately. Ready for flight, sir. The crew are at their station. Thank you. Professor, why don't you show our young friend through the ship while I have a last-minute conference with my officers? Of course, Commander. Come along, Vidre. You'll be more than interested. Thank you. 
I should like to see the rest of the ship. Well, as you probably gather, this is the fuel room. Mm-hmm. Well, on the deck below are the nuclear propulsion engines. Uh, watch your head. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, this is the crew's quarters. And beneath it are storage quarters for ship supplies and equipment. It's strange, Professor, but from the outside, the IPX-4 seems so much larger than from in here. Well, that's easy enough to explain, Vidre. You see, the IPX-4 is... Is a hull within a hull, and this is the inner hull. Oh, I see. And it's the outer hull that protects it. Yes. To break through the field of gravitation of this planet, we must achieve a speed of 20,000 miles per hour. At that speed, friction creates great heat on the outer hull. Heat which we, fortunately, won't feel in this hull. I understand. Is this the control room? Yes. And don't be overawed by these hundreds of controls and instruments. In time, you'll come to understand them all. That large screen, is that the eye of the ship? Yes. Once we're in flight, what lies before us is projected on the screen. Stand by, Zal, for flight orders. Yes, sir. Stand by for flight orders. Well, gentlemen, the moment has arrived. Sound warning signal. Sound warning signal. Switch on flight vision screen. Switch on flight vision screen. Establish contact with base. Establish contact with base. Cut in nuclear jet number one. Cut in nuclear jet number one. We're taking off, EJ. Cut in nuclear jet number two. Cut in nuclear jet number two. Instrument reading. Rate of flight. 500 miles per hour. Altitude, 1,000 feet. Rate of flight, 2,000 miles per hour. Altitude, 150,000 feet. Don't worry if you start to black out the day. It's to be expected. The crew is conditioned for it. Rate of flight, 5,000 miles per hour. Altitude, 140,000 feet. Rate of flight, 10,000 miles per hour. Altitude, 300,000 feet. This is a crucial moment today. Rate of flight, 11,000 miles per hour. Altitude, 500,000 feet. Rate of flight, 13,000 miles per hour. Altitude, 700,000 feet. Hear that, sir, Professor? We've broken through. We're in space. Yes. Rate of flight... 24,000 miles per hour. Flight distance covered. 2,000 miles. We've made it, Professor. With each minute of flight, our speed accelerates. Yes. We should soon reach our maximum speed of 50,000 miles per hour. Rate of flight, 30,000 miles per hour. Flight distance covered. 3,000 miles. Take over, Zal. Yes, sir. What's the matter with the Did you black out? Yes. He wasn't conditioned for the flight. Oh, he'll be all right in a few minutes. When he is, bring him into the chart room. I'll be plotting our course. Come in, Vidre, Professor. How do you feel, Vidre? I'm all right now, sir. <laughs> Have a seat. Thank you. I've just been plotting our course to the planet Xevious. Xevious, sir? Why Xevious? It isn't the nearest planet. Well, that's quite true, Vidre. But through the use of a spectrometer, we've been able to determine that Xevious can support human life. The composition of the air on that planet isn't much different from our own. The air of our planet contains 22.8% oxygen and 77% nitrogen and traces of other gases. And Xevious? And Xevious, the oxygen content is 20.5%. A little less than our own. The nitrogen content is 79%. Well, we shouldn't have too much difficulty breathing on Xevious. I'm afraid I'm not too familiar with Xevious. How does it compare with our planet in other respects? Well, three-fourths of Xevious seems to be water. The land is divided into two continents. Very much like our own planet. Yes. The circumference is approximately uh, 28,000 miles. 300 years ago, our astronomers noted huge explosions on Xevious. For a time, they thought it was disintegrating. But it didn't. 
Yes, and since those huge explosions 300 years ago, there have been no additional ones. Professor, do you think there might be human life on Zevia? Oh, it's quite possible, Vidre. We should reach Zevia in 60 days. Perhaps, then, Vidre, we shall have the answer. Stand by to land on Xevious. Attention, crew members. Stand by to land on Xevious. And they're approaching Xevious already. It's exerting a strong pull toward its surface. Yes. Switch on radar sender. Switch on radar sender. Our radar signals are reaching Xevious and being reflected back off its surface. As we get closer, the speed of the signals will accelerate. I see. Cut nuclear jet number two. Cut nuclear jet number two. Cut nuclear jet number one. Cut nuclear jet number one. How quiet it is. Seems strange not to hear the engines after 61 days. Instrument rating. Rate of descent, 500 miles per hour. Approaching stratosphere. Altitude, 400,000 feet. Rate of descent, 600 miles. Altitude, 300,000 feet. Our speed is increasing. Why? We're in previous orbit. Gravity is pulling us down toward it. Switch on retarding jet number one. Switch on retarding jet number one. Instrument rating. Rate of descent, 400 miles per hour. Altitude, 200,000 feet. Professor, look. You can clearly make out the surface now. 300 miles. Yes. Altitude. Yes, we're near the coast of one of the continents. That uh, small silvery thread of the river flowing into the sea. 100 miles How per green hour. it is. Altitude. Devious has plants like, just like our own planet. Yes. That river's quite a large one. Far larger than any we have. Covering. Only 50,000 feet. Commander's Altitude. evidently going to land near that mountain overlooking the river. Rather hilly country. Yes. It's too bad feet. darkness is falling. 600. 400. 200. 100. Flight completed. We've landed. Cut retarding jet number one. Cut retarding jet number one. Cut radar sender. Cut radar sender. Well, gentlemen, we've done it. Flown 80 million miles from our own planet to Zetius. Congratulations, Commander. Thank you. Well, it's already grown dark. We'll wait until morning before leaving the ship. Meanwhile, Professor, I suggest you make extensive tests of the air on Zetius. We can't be too careful. Mm, quite agree. I'll proceed at once, Commander. You'll have a full report by morning. <laughs> Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Well, I've made a thorough analysis of the air, Commander, and it substantiates our earlier findings. In other words, we can live out there. Yes. Well, we may find ourselves a little short of breath now and then due to less oxygen than we're used to. It's perfectly safe. Good. I'll give orders to have the nuclear copter assembled for flight. The three of us will make an exploratory trip over this area. Be prepared to leave in exactly one hour. <laughs> Ready for takeoff, I suggest you fasten your safety belt, gentlemen. I'm ready. Stand clear. We'll rise straight up and have a look around. Look, we are high enough now to see the river. It's enormous. Yes. I should estimate it to be at least, oh, a mile in width. Seems to flow into that bay and then out to sea. Professor, look. To your left, across the river. Where are you pointing to? All I see are trees and greener. Well, wait till we rise a little higher. Ah, uh, yes. That greenery is growing on top of immense ruins. You see them, don't you, Commander? Yes. Yes, I think you're right, Betray. Apparently, it's an island. Yes, it is. Let's fly over and have a look. The island itself doesn't seem to be very large. Oh, yes, yes, I see the ruins now. And they're barely discernible under the growth of trees and grass that covers you. Well, where are you going to land, Commander? We'll uh, put down on that huge ruin directly ahead. 
from it, we'll have a good view of the entire island. Well, these ruins are truly amazing, Commander. Thousands and thousands of buildings and dwellings covered by trees and grass. These are the ruins of a great civilization. How old would you estimate these ruins to be, Professor? From a rather hasty study of the plant life that's grown over it, I should say approximately, oh, 300 years. 300 years. Do you think those huge explosions our astronomers saw on this planet 300 years ago might have wiped out this civilization? That's quite possible, Commander. Where's Vidre gotten to? Oh, there he is. Oh, Vidre! Don't get too near the edge. You may fall over. I'm being quite careful, Professor. I just wanted to see what was below us. This ruin we're standing on must have been a huge building leveled by some great force. If you look over the edge, you'll see that it slopes down to what seems to be streets. Streets? Yes, very much like those on our own planet. It would be quite possible for us to make our way down the side of this ruin to the bottom. Can't be more than 200 feet. What do you think, Professor? Why not? By all means, let's descend and have a look around. Well, we only have a few more feet. Oh, watch your footing here. These rocks keep giving way beneath me. Yes. It would be quite easy to break a leg here. You all right, Professor? Uh, yes, Commander. Well, here we are. Oh, it seems as though we've descended a thousand feet instead of only two hundred. Yes. It's rather dark down here. Everything's in shadow. Yes, you were quite right, Vidre. Beneath this rubble we're standing on, there seems to be a paved street. Let's have a look around, shall we? Look at those ruins. Seem to have been huge buildings. Yes, but I mean, they judge they must have been seven, eight, two, perhaps a thousand feet high. Apparently, this civilization was almost as highly developed as ours before it was destroyed. Yes, Professor, do you think it's possible that there may be descendants of the people who built this civilization? It's possible, of course, but as yet I've seen no signs of them. Look, there's a building which hasn't been entirely destroyed. Let's have a look inside. Yes, by all means. Perhaps we'll discover objects that will give us more information about the race that once lived here. How huge that entrance is. It looks quite dark in there. Unfortunately, I have a small torch. Come along. Look at the size of this chamber. Why, the ceiling is at least 40 feet high. Professor... This building must have been an institution, a, a library. Look at the thousands of books lying on the floor, simply rotting away. Yes, yes, you're right. Look at this book, Professor. It's about twice the size of our own. Yes. It's too bad it's been exposed to the elements. Pages are yellow. The printing is all but faded. Uh, here, here's another one on the floor. Uh, it's a much larger book, and bound in some sort of animal skin. Uh, let me see it. Yes, yes, this is in much better condition. We shall take it back to the ship, Ridre. See if one of our scientists can decipher the language it's printed in. Uh, Professor, would you come here for a minute? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Look. These ashes on the floor. Looks like the remains of a fire. Yes. Yes, you're right. It appears to be only a few weeks old. A few weeks old? Then... Then that means... Yes. There were survivors of the Holocaust that destroyed this civilization. Their descendants may be here, in these ruins, watching us. That's quite possible. However, we're armed. I... I wonder what they look like. Perhaps after a time, when they get used to the sight of us, they'll show themselves. Yes. Uh... What, what was that? Sounds like a signal of some sort. Yes, you're right. I suggest we leave, Commander. Yes, come along. Uh, 
It feels good to get out of that dark chamber. Uh, there it is again. Only much closer. There's no need to get alarmed, Vidran. We only knew what they looked like. I dare say we frightened them as much as they do us. I, I think we're being followed. I saw a huge figure back there slipping from one room to another. Oh, nonsense, Vidran, you're imagining. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. For a moment, I caught a glimpse of someone behind us, too. We are almost at the foot of the ruin which we descended. We haven't much further to go. Perhaps we ought to fire our weapons as a warning. No, 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 no. They'd surely take it as a threatening gesture. We don't want to do that. Yes, well, here we are. Let's not waste any time climbing to the top. Uh, 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 yes, they still seem to be following. Now and then I can make out a shadowy figure... It's almost impossible to tell what they look like. I cling to the shadows. They, they seem enormous. Much larger than ourselves. You mustn't let your imagination run away with you. It's, it's amazing how much faster we're going up than when we came down. We're almost at the top. I have a feeling they won't try to climb this ruin after us. Evidently, they don't like daylight. Ah, here we are. Professor, look out, Hutton. Close? What was it? They threw some sort of weapon at you. Why, it's nothing but a long, round pole with a sharp piece of metal on the end. It's a spear. We have them in our museums. It's the weapon of a primitive tribe. Then, then they must be little more than savages. Yes. And I don't think they'll come after us, but I suggest we take off and return to the ship. Yes, sir? I don't expect any trouble, but turn on the radar system for protection. If anyone approaches the ship, the alarm will go off. Yes, sir. Why are you so fascinated by that spear, Vidre? You've been examining it for ten minutes now. Well, it's just that... Well, it's an, en en an enigma, Commander. We find the ruins of a great civilization. Huge buildings, dwellings, streets. A city that must have had four or five million people. What happened to them? We can only surmise, Vidre. Perhaps it was a violent quake, a gigantic tidal wave, or some other huge force that all but wiped them out. And the spear. Could it have been hurled by a descendant of that great race that built all that? Yes, it's quite likely. But look at this spear. The man who threw it was little more than a savage. Perhaps the wheel of evolution has slowly turned to its starting point. It's difficult to say. The alarm. Someone's brought it through the radar system. All crew members, attention. Report your stations. Switch on radar screen. Switch on radar screen. It's too bad night has fallen. Green reveals nothing but shadowy trees. Yes. What's that? Sounds very much like spears bouncing off the hull. Yes, we're being attacked. One of those spears can certainly do us no harm. Commander, look at the radar screen. It's a huge figure. It's hard to make off. He's carrying a burning torch. Yes. Zalf. Yes, sir. If that figure carrying that torch attempts to approach, fire on him with a ray beam. Yes, sir. Look, he's running towards us. Yes, he's about to set the ship on fire. Look how huge he is. He's simply gigantic. Yes, sir. Zalf, fire. Yes, sir. He's down. Only a few yards from the ship. Yes. He doesn't seem to be dead. I can see him moving. A burst from a ray beam would have killed any of us. It only seems to have wounded him. South. Yes, sir. Order a party of six men to go out and bring that... that monster in here. Yes, sir. At once. They're bringing him in now, Commander. Yes. Uh, bring him over here, man. He's much too big for the bed. All right, lie him down on the floor. Good, good, good. That's it. He's dying. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do for him. He's trying to say something. If we only knew his language. Professor, he's dead. Too bad. Sorry, we had to fire on him. 
I was hoping we could establish friendly relations with the people of Zevius. Look at the size of him. He's gigantic. Even larger than I thought. Yes. You must measure at least here. Let me see. Oh, Professor, the leather-bound book you found in the ruins. I've succeeded in deciphering the language. I've already translated the first two pages. Be patient a moment, Ledo. I want to finish my examination of this man of Zevius. Uh, it's amazing. Simply amazing. Uh, this book you found is apparently the key to their civilization. As soon as I've translated the rest of it, I'm sure we'll have a... This man of Zevius, I should say, he weighs at least 200 pounds. And as for his height, he's at least six feet one. Six feet one? Why, that would make him almost twice as tall as we are. Yes. But that isn't all. He only has five fingers. Five fingers? Are you sure? Positive. Please, sir, I wish you'd let me read you the translation of the book you found in the ruins. Oh, yes. Yes, Pedro. By all means. Go ahead. Well, I I've translated only the first two pages. It begins this way. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was a desolate waste with darkness covering the abyss and a tempestuous wind raging over the surface of the waters. Uh, it's evident, sir, that this planet we know as Zevius was called Earth by the race that wrote this book. Earth. Hmm. I wonder what happened to the people of Earth that brought their civilization to an end. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little visit to the planet Zevius? A better known to us as Earth. What's that, madam? You don't like the sort of civilization being destroyed? Well, fortunately, it doesn't have to happen. Not if we don't want it to. Oh, by the way, uh, all names of characters in this story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons is uh, strictly out of this world. And... Oh, you have to get off here, I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again... I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler with Maurice Tarplin in the title role. Others in our cast were Ralph Bell, Larry Haynes, and Lawson Zerby. All characters in this story were fictitious. Any resemblance to the names of actual persons living or dead was purely coincidental. Original music composed and played by Al Finelli. Bill Tonkin speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.